Good evening. Um, start off with just with one announcement, and then we'll get into our study. Uh, tomorrow evening, 6 uh, o'clock, there's going to be a ladies' Bible study. So, man, if you show up, you're going to have to wait outside. Okay? Ladies' Bible study tomorrow at 6. Um, so we're going to be... Are we okay with audio back there? Yep, good. We're going to be in 2 Thessalonians this evening, chapter 2, starting chapter 2. But before we get into that, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the stability that your word gives us. Thank you that we can trust and rest and look to you and, and be strong in our faith and in our thinking because you've given us your word and you've given us the power of your Holy Spirit to work in our very minds and hearts. Thank you for that. Thank you that no matter what's going on around us, we can stand firm and courageous and in faith in you. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, that what you're going to do. I just ask that you would just give us something to, that we need in our minds and our hearts. Give us something to take out of here into this rest of this week. Lord, thank you for this, um, this message, this uh, passage. Thank you for uh, giving it to us uh, to inform us of what your, what your plan is. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, and we're, we're talking about the uh, church in Thessalonica. Uh, this is a church that Paul established in the second missionary journey. And Paul wasn't actually there very long. It was a new church. And it's more than likely that from his first visit to the writing of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, it was probably less than one year. Uh, and so he, he established this church, Timothy and I think Silas were, were um, stayed behind to encourage them and teach them. But Paul went on and then he wrote them again about problems he was hearing about in the church. <clears throat> so, so the new church, they received two, uh, two letters from Paul in a very short amount of time. And this church was troubled by things like many other churches were. It seems like this church has one specific area of trouble in their midst. But um, a new church persecuted by Jews because they hated this message of Jesus. This message actually blamed the Jews for killing Jesus. Uh, and the Jews were zealous for the things of the Old Testament, not recognizing that this Jesus was the, the completion of all the messages in the Old Testament. And they wouldn't accept that because they were looking for someone else. So they were persecuted because they followed Jesus, which looked like a start of a different religious. It really was just a continuation of God's plan from, the, from everything in the Old Testament. They also uh, had the battle against the idea of the Roman gods in those days. I mean, I mean think about this from the Roman point of view. These Christians, and other people too, but these Christians, they only have one God. How ridiculous is that? And that, that was their mindset. And then so the Romans follow many gods, and, the, and Christians oppose them, saying there is only one God, every other God is false God. Uh, so that make Romans mad at them, persecute them. And, then, and we know some of the history, they killed many Christians. Um, and then also there was challenges to Paul's specific teaching uh, as this church was being established and, and growing. And, and, and also physical persecution. In uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, it says, that um, Paul's talking about their steadfastness and faith in persecutions and in afflictions. So they were suffering from attacks from these kind of people and also in the, the teaching that was happening around the challenge to Paul's teaching. So let's get into this. Uh, chapter, four, chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses at a time, and then we'll talk about some of the details. Um, it says, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. I, we just stop right there. It's, oh, Lord, that's awesome. I love this idea of you coming and me being gathered to you. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's a thing that, that gives us hope. But when does it happen? And that was the struggle of, these, of this church. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered and together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed 
either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So the, 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 the misunderstanding, the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, and when they were going to be gathered, when Christians were going to be gathered together with him. That was their, this subject that Paul's writing about. It was the threat to their understanding. Uh, the day of the Lord's already come, and, and, and then we missed it. And some of them, some of, or it's, it's now coming real short, so we, not, we can just give up doing our normal stuff of life. Those are the two things that are, that are at play here. And they were waiting for Jesus. Imagine this. They, they had, we have something they didn't have, but imagine this. Paul comes, preaches this message of Jesus, the Messiah of all the Old Testament. He went to the presence of the Father. He, oh, he came, he died, he, he died for the forgiveness of our sins, and he went to the presence of the Father. And you know what? He's coming again. And at this point... It's been maybe 17, 18 years. And surely the Lord's not going to delay more than 19 or 20 years to come back, right? So since that's true, I had long-term plans, but I don't need to do those now. I mean, they're waiting for Jesus. They're expecting him. Just like maybe the apostles, when Jesus rose into the clouds, maybe they were just looking up there thinking, okay, he's coming right back, just like he left. I mean, that, that was the, the thing that they were looking for, Jesus coming back. And the thing that we have that they didn't have is 2,000 years of church history. They didn't have that. They didn't know when this was going to happen. Jesus was coming again like you promised. Okay, in, 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 in the end of November, right? Or, or maybe at the latest next year. Uh, and so they were, that was a big subject. It was, it was hopeful, but, but they weren't understanding. Um, and we have these 2,000 years. But, but our challenge today could be, it's been 2,000 years. He's not coming back. Couldn't it? I mean, can, can you see the human mind working that way? Um, and we get so focused in our time or our understanding of history that we come to a wrong conclusion. Because um, think about that. What's 2,000 years to God? I mean, really, what is it? Well, what does Peter say? A day, two days. Oh, sorry, two days. I missed that up by such a big amount. Two days, two days ago, Jesus went, went to be with, with his father. Oh, two, that's not that big a deal. How many thousands and thousands of years from the time of the first declaration that someone's coming up to the birth of Christ? Four, six thousand years. How many years was that? Thousands of years. No big deal. Over over this amount of time that we have in our church history, more than that from the promise of Abraham to the coming of Christ, more than 2,000 years. And God still fulfilled his promise. So 2,000 years, no big deal. Not to God. God wants to save people. Wants to save people. So far during the course of 2,000 years. We look forward to his coming, us being gathered together to him, uh, and we don't lose heart because of the time thing. Because we know the work's been done. However it happens, we die physically, or he comes before we die physically, we're going to be with him. And none of us know the time. Have the hope, but don't act like you know what time it's going to be. And so Paul says, um, here's the subject. And he says, we ask you, brothers, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. So can I say here at ELW on Valencia, brothers, I ask you, brothers and sisters, I ask, don't be alarmed. Don't let your minds be shaken. Don't, don't worry about this thing. Um, and, and there's all kinds of things that, that can shake us in our minds, like, oh, no, what's going on? Or, or alarmed, oh, no, something's going on, and I don't know what to do. Because God's in control of all our circumstances. He's got it all worked out. And we're going to see in this passage that things are going to happen exactly according to the way God has planned them from the beginning. It's going to happen exactly that. We can rest in that. So what's shaking our world today? Anything? No big deal? Is anything happening, shaking our world today? Um, politics? That's shaking your world at all? 
that causing you to be alarmed? If we don't be careful, it can. I have to to admit, during these days, I've been a little bit shaken in my mind, a little bit alarmed, but the Holy Spirit's always reminding me, no, Kevin, don't worry about it. I'm in charge. This is not, this has nothing to do with my kingdom here. My kingdom is eternal and I'm going to be your king forever. Awesome. And right now too. So there's, so don't be shaken in your mind. I know you've experienced it, right? Sometime in your life, shaken or alarmed. Oh no, what am I going to do? Mostly it's just vain imaginations. Waste of our imagination that God's given us, right? We can imagine things and worry is a waste of it. <clears throat> and so think about this, this shake. Don't be alarmed or shaken in our circumstances. Um, God's given us stuff that's great. Let's, let's walk in that. One of the things that God's given us is our gathering together. We are a vital establishment we, in our culture. We are need each other. And God has given us this thing that's the church to gather together. Don't be shaken. Don't be afraid. That's for us, no matter what. Don't you think? I mean, that's what his word says. And we need it. And Paul says, don't be shaken in your mind or alarmed by a spirit. Some spirit comes along. Now, what does the spirit thing mean? Um, Really, in its core, it is a spirit. Because spirits are working. They are. God created angels. Some of them rebelled. And they're called demons. And they're spirits working in this world. Don't be shaken by that. Now, you and I can't always tell if it's a spirit or just a philosophy of man or some new fad that wants to creep into the church. We can't always tell that. Are we battling the same, though, in some, in some cases? But there are spirits. There's spirits. Well, there's religions today in our country that say our faith started by an angel talking to our prophet. That exists, and it's a super big religion. Um, That's the way they started. And they they would say, oh, but an angel communicated this to us. And it looks something different than what we find in the Bible. Oh, Oh, and by the way, in the Bible, it says... But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Accursed. Nothing to do with it. It's evil. Even if it's an angel from heaven. Well, angels who are obedient to God aren't going to do that. Angels who are disobedient to God are always trying to do that. So spirits. And we, we, we can learn to discern some of that sometimes and learn how to confront it. But it happens. 1 John 4, 1 says, we're supposed to put every spirit to the test. And the spirit may come in the form of a blatant um, demonstration of evil or just some teaching or philosophy. So it's, don't be shaken by spirit. Even if an angel says something, even if you see an angel say something and it's contrary to what you find in God's word, don't worry about it. It has nothing to do with God. Don't be shaken by it. Don't be alarmed by it. It says also, by some teaching, never amazes, never ceases to amaze me how many new ideas are trying to creep into the church. New fads. Um, the church in our country is no doubt changing, isn't it? All over the place, you see all kinds of things from church light to church weird to church stupid to church apostate. And they still call themselves the church because they want to look like they're religious, faithful people. But they've departed from the, the, the communication that God has given us in his word. And it's all over the place. First Thessalonians 5.21 says, Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Reject what is evil. But you've got to hold fast. And you've got to test. You've got to learn how to test. It doesn't come naturally. You've got to learn how to test. We have to learn how to test. Paul's telling these 
these, these, uh, these um, people in, in Thessalonica, uh, don't be alarmed. You've got you to examine these things. Also, don't be alarmed by something written. Um, and he even says, as a letter supposedly being from us. Well, the fact is, Paul would never contradict what he previously taught, just as the Bible never contradicts itself. Never going to find it. Now, there's things that, that crop up that are apparent contradictions, but when you really get in and dig and study them out, they're not contradictions, because God, the Bible is God's communication to us. God does not contradict himself. We should never act like it does. We never argue one part of God's word against another. I mean, they could have even done this with this subject. Jesus has already come. Look at the circumstances around you. This is the tribulation. Talking about things that are happening only in their city. That's not end times things. It's end times things. The coming of the Lord, us being gathered to him. It's a worldwide thing. That's why we can't look at what's happening in our country and say, these are the end times. Now, it might be, but not because of what's happening here. It's a bigger picture thing. We might be heading towards end times troubles, or we might be heading towards the fall of our nation. We don't know yet for sure. So we can't just conclude that just because of our own experience, because that that's how they were being shaken, their own experience. Trouble, and we're not supposed to experience God's wrath. Well, well, that wasn't God's wrath for sin on the earth in the city of Thessalonica. It was just their um, circumstances and people who hate the gospel treating them poorly. And they were, sh- they were, they were being shaken by it. Paul writes them to counter that. There's always people writing new things. The best-selling novel, the best-selling instructional book, how to build your organization, all kinds of stuff like that. Creep into the church. It never ceased to amaze me when we were missionaries in South America. We come home every four to five years. It's been a year in the United States. Every furlough, the church was doing some new magical thing. And then the next furlough, some other new wonderful thing. And they wouldn't even mention the previous thing. And another fur- another new thing. Oh, brother. Wait a minute. God doesn't magnify that one thing in his word, one year and then not the next. He doesn't do that. We don't follow fads. We're not shaken. We're not moved. We, we don't follow some single leader and take us into some whatever new thing he wants to do. The church fails when that happens. And the funny thing is, missionaries got affected by that. A pastor's gung ho for missions and wants to support missionaries. And in and, and a couple of years, he's gone. Another guy comes in. Oh, he doesn't like missionaries. Oh, so what are we supposed to do? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of weird, what, isn't it? Mostly that doesn't happen, but sometimes it does. So don't be shaken by any philosophy, spirit, teaching, some new book that gets written. If it doesn't match up and, and is driven by what God has communicated to us in his written word, it's probably something to be just ignored. Or get to know it so you can confute, so you can refute it among your other brothers and sisters who go to one of those church light things, or church weird, or church just absolutely dumb. Because lots of people call them. So those Christians go to those kind of churches. And those are building and getting bigger in our country. Second Timothy 1 7 says, God gave us a spirit of power and love and self-control. If that doesn't communicate stability, nothing else does. This is what God's given. He's given it, and we are called to be faithful to that. Because we can be given it and that not and then not walk in it, not live it out. And we what we end up being shaken in mind, and alarmed. That can happen to us. It can. We're going to talk about the hows of that. So, so how are you living right now? Power. I'm going to do what God has told me to do. And nothing is going to get in the way of that. I'm going to love God. I'm going to love other people. And I'm going to do my part in making disciples. 
and being a disciple and loving other people and being self-controlled, not just doing whatever I want. I'm going to live with purpose. But the purpose is driven by what God's communicated. What is that for you? That looks different for all of us. But it's something in holiness. It's something in love. And something driven by what God has said. So, coming of the Lord, being gathered together to Him, don't be, don't, I ask you not to be alarmed by any of these things. And He says, let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, will, which day? Coming of the Lord and us being gathered together to Him will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Um, it says, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Let no one deceive you in any way. I mean, we could spend a whole other messages on just on that. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, let no one deceive you. You know what that means? You know how to do that? Let no one deceive you. Paul's telling these people, it's like a command. Let no one deceive you. What does that mean for us? How do we not let? What do you think? You can answer that question. What do you think? How do we not let? Not, don't let anyone deceive you. How do we do that? What do you think? What's that? The word? What? Know the word and know God. That's, that's the answer in a nutshell. What does that mean? Know the word and know God. How does it practically work out in our lives? You and I have to be individually, as an individual person, dedicated to the constant growing and the knowledge of what God's communicated and let that take hold in our minds. Once that takes hold, everything else takes care of itself. Doesn't it? Read, and, but the thing is, though, this is, what, this is what's hard to grasp sometimes. It's a lifelong thing, this renewal of the mind. It's a process that lasts from the day I came to the Lord to my last breath here on earth. And who knows, am I going for all of eternity because our God is infinite and eternal and huge and big? Who knows? I don't know how long that's going to go. But for now, we know what it is. It's a process that we dedicate our soup. Put something in constantly, always. And when I put that good stuff in, there's only so much room there. The bad stuff has to leave. You know what happens when I stop the process? It goes back. It's not like the good stuff just leaves because the bad stuff comes back. And it's good at it because there's, there's all kinds of things, spirits, things I hear about, new ideas that want to come back and fill my mind. I have to be constantly dedicated. If I don't do that, um, I will be letting someone deceive me. I'm not dedicated to that renewal of the mind. I'm a candidate, you're a candidate, to turn out to be deceived and live your life in a lie. Let no one deceive you. That means stay dedicated to the process of the renewal of your mind. It takes a little bit of work, doesn't it? But you know what? It brings, it brings a solid thinking person. I can discern the things around me, and I can make decisions based on what I discern. And I can see chaos around me and know that God's in control and I can relax and rest and trust and keep going on with my life and keep loving people even though they treat me terrible. Because God has everything under control. And even the ones that are treating me terrible today, God may end up saving because I don't respond to them like they want to treat me. Don't let anyone deceive you. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is a verse that I referred to to renew our minds so we can prove what is the good and acceptable will of God. We can live it out. can't live it out if your mind is wrong. 
And however you lived out, it'll be a result of what's in your mind. Always is for everybody. What you live like, that's a result of what's in your mind. If you really believe God, people will be able to tell, especially the believers. And so how do people let themselves um, get deceived? How does this happen? An idea comes in, and it gets planted, and it grows, and it's unchallenged, undirected. And people start following it, and they give themselves over to lies. We're going to see what happens to those people a little bit later here. I, there's an example I heard. Uh, oh, let's see. It's been maybe a year, year and a half or so. This lady was saying, um, my grandson, um, he's such a nice kid, and, and, he's, and he's homosexual, and he's such a nice kid, and I see him, and I just love him, and all he did to, to get that way, he's like 18 years old, all he did to get that way was just be born. What? No, that's not all that happened. Something got into his mind at some point in his life. And, and may, or maybe some kind of trauma happened to him. And he got confused and his mind got derailed. And there was no one to interject in his life to steer him and help him start keep thinking right. Or maybe nobody knew about what was going on in his mind. And he just kept the idea and it was unchallenged. And then it grew and then it grew, grew into more thinking and then it grew into action and then grew into a lifestyle. It didn't just happen. It never does. We go through a process. We get derailed in our mind. Christians can get derailed, but it needs to be challenged so that you can not let people deceive you. And that's going to come from what we find written in God's Word and sometimes the help of other believers in combination. Because these people, these Christians, believers in Thessalonica, they are being moved towards being deceived, being shaken. Paul writes them to help them. And so, the coming of Christ and our gathering, uh, our, uh, the gathering of ourselves to Him cannot happen unless something comes first, the rebellion. Now, maybe some of the Thessalonians looked like in their city their, that was the rebellion. Because Paul had already taught this to them. He was reminding them. The rebellion comes first, but it's not about what happens in front of me. It's not, what, about, it's not about what happens in Tucson or in the United States. This thing, this rebellion, is massive. This is a worldwide rebellion against God. Do we see that happening today? It's not just in the United States. It's happening around the world. Church light, church apostate, Church ridiculous. It's popping up all over the place. It just is. People are departing from the authority of God's word. And this is going to be a big thing. Now, if this is not it, or at least the starting of it, no, I can't even say it's the start of it anymore. It's been going on for years. I don't know how big this is going to get. It's, to me, we're done. Lord, come. Except for there's more here. But the rebellion is going on. Um, listen what um, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5 says. But understand this, because Paul writes about these, this coming of the Lord and our being gathered to him in various places, and it's referred to even by Jesus. But it says, understand this, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. Understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. <coughs> we might be heading toward them. I mean, actual difficulty. In the United States as a whole, we don't know what that even means. We're just a prosperous nation. And we've gotten lazy sometimes because we like our stuff and we like our comfort. But this is saying difficult times are going to come, maybe to the United States, maybe in our lifetime. I mean, difficult. We're going to feel it in our households. For people will be lovers of self. You hear about that? People are lovers of self and it's growing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Churches are dedicated to this. Uh, lovers of money. Churches are dedicated to this too. Jesus wants you to be rich and healthy all of your life. And if you're a Christian, that's what you're going to be. Lovers of money. Prosperity movement. It's a lie. 
Lovers of money is creeping into what's called the church. <coughs> Proud, arrogant, abusive. Hear about more abusiveness growing in, in these days? Uh, human trafficking, sex slaves, uh, children being abandoned, caseworkers in Tucson are overwhelmed by parents who abandon their kids or abuse their kids. Disobedient to their parents, that's all over the place. Even families that are together, you just see, like, how can you talk to your parents like that? Parents, how can you let them <coughs> get involved in their lives? Don't know how. People will be ungrateful. They'll be unholy. See unholiness growing much? Laws to protect evil behavior. Laws to protect growing, disgusting immorality. Laws to protect the killing of people for convenience sake. I'm referring to abortion. Millions of people are being killed for convenience. Unholy, lovers of self, heartless, unappeasable. You can't reason with people. They're just stuck in their own way of thinking and they don't want to hear anything else. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal. <coughs> we haven't experienced a ton of brutality in our nation, but it happens all over the world. Brutality, just things that oh, we can't even imagine here, happen in the streets. Um, it's, it's, will we experience it here? Uh, very possible. Excuse me, I'm going to turn my phone off. One time that I forgot. Brutality. Um, let's see, where am I here? Not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Does anything come to mind in politics? Swollen with conceit? Oh, brother. Not going to mention any names. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All kinds of sexual perversion growing in our country. God made the sexual relationship for pleasure, um, but not all the things that people try to invent. Lovers of pleasure rather than considering what God has done in our bodies and what it's for. Yep, it's growing like crazy. Having the appearance of godliness, all these evil people, some of them at least, want to go to church and say they're okay with Jesus. Jesus loves everybody. Appearance of godliness, but denying its power and the holiness connected with people who say they follow God. Living without sin. Avoid such people, Paul says. We're definitely going to avoid their teaching. We're going to definitely going to avoid their life choices. Um, we love people, and if they come into our life, we, we love them. If we have opportunity, we talk to them about the Lord. We're not going to practice their lifestyles. We're not going to agree with it. We're not going to say it's okay. In a, this rebellion time, people are going to be this way. Worldwide, not just in our place. Whatever that means. <laughs> and it's probably going to look like the days of Noah. The rebellion. You think about that. In the days of Noah, God said, the whole earth is corrupt. Millions and millions, maybe billions of people on the earth in those days. All of them departed from God except for a couple people, eight. We didn't even know how devoted the kids were and his wife, but Noah, they were all, that was the rebellion. It's going to look like that now, and it's growing right now to look like that. Except God has his church on this earth still. It says, um, the rebellion will come, and, 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 the, and the coming of the Lord won't come before the rebellion. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. It, and I thought it was interesting that I'm talking about the man of lawlessness, and we haven't re just received the, the results for our election yet. But, uh, I don't know. I'm not saying Biden or Trump was lawlessness, but. The lawlessness is going to be revealed. And that's what it feels like, though, in politics. The man of lawlessness is going to be revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat 
in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, there have been many lawless people, and some of them super lawless, but this is going to be the one, the one, the one man who's going to be raised up and everybody's going to know who he is. And most of the world's not going to think he's lawless. Not in the beginning, for sure. But he's going to be raised up. And during his time on earth, he's going to take the place that no man should ever take. The place of God. Declaring himself, follow me. I'm the one. I'm the Christ. I'm the Savior. Now, there's been all kinds of people throughout history that have done that. But they, had, they weren't the one. They didn't, get a, they didn't come during the worldwide rebellion. And they haven't come to this place in God's, in, in God's plan. <coughs> so Paul's uh, comforting these and instructing these believers in this church. And he says in verse 5, Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? This wasn't new for them. Paul was reminding them. Ever need to be reminded about something? You know, I, I know you're like me. You're, you're really good. You got this forgetting stuff mastered, right? We forget stuff. We need to be reminded. So any influence you have in people's lives um, that, that evolves around anything to do with godliness and the word of God, don't be afraid to talk about the same subject multiple times. We need it. Pastors should not be afraid of preaching the same sermons, the same concept multiple times. Because we forget the important stuff. We just do. There's all kinds of passages that talk about, remind the people, I remind you. I have a list here, but I'm not going to go through it tonight. <coughs> Super important subject. Uh, a friend of mine years ago preached a message called um, the ministry of reminder. Reminding people and being reminded. And this man of lawlessness, <coughs> Paul is reminding them that this guy is coming. Told you once before, but apparently forgotten it. So I'm telling you again, it doesn't say you terrible people. He just reminds them. He just lets them know what they need to remember. And then we get into some more of this lawless man, lawless man, some of his details. And this is going to be a man more than likely possessed by Satan himself. <coughs> it says in, in verse um, 6, 6 through, I'll go to read to 10. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. For only, uh, only he who now restrains will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless, lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power, with all false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for, deception for, those, who are, for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. That's what this one is going to be like. Except he's not here yet because the one who restrains is still restraining, still holding back the fullness of this rebellion. It hasn't quite got there yet. And I'm just going to say, I believe we're talking about the Holy Spirit here, the one who restrains. God himself is restraining things. And God himself is doing this, so his plan will be accomplished every step of it in the process according to what he's already decided. It will happen exactly in his time. Also, the Holy Spirit uses us to restrain evil, doesn't he? Uh, he works in us. We speak out against evil. And sometimes people listen, and it calms the evil down for a little bit. But during this time, it's going to increase. Because the, the, the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, and that part of his ministry is going to be taken out of the way. And then evil is just going to blow up. And this might be a reference to um, what we hope to be true in the rapture, that God takes the church out. And the people who are possessed with the Holy Spirit, indwelt with the Holy Spirit, are gone. Maybe, talking about that. Either that and or it, just his miraculous power of putting down evil to restrain it. 
And that's cool. Because that means no matter what happens, I can trust God he's at working, even though sometimes I don't get it. But he is. I can remember that. I can, it helps me rest. helps me not worry. <coughs> the mystery of lawlessness is... The mystery of lawlessness is already at work and has been for a long time. It's growing. There's lawlessness. Why is it a mystery? Mystery of lawlessness. Mystery is something that it's not yet known. The Bible talks about the mystery of Christ in the New Testament. Well, that's not a mystery anymore. We know what that means. Christ has come and we can know God. And Christ did it for us. The mystery of lawlessness is still going on. Mystery. One of the mysteries is, is how long is it going to be? And how big is it going to get? And lawlessness involves all kinds of people having received all kinds of great things uh, from God and and turning away from Him. It's a mystery to me how dumb people can be. (laughs) Don't you think? Why why do you act like that? I don't get it. Well, we get it because we have the Holy Spirit working in us. It's a mystery in various ways. It is still going. Lawlessness is still still at work. And it will be uh, unrestrained one day. Evil, immorality, all that list that I read from from Timothy, it's going to be unrestrained. That's going to be difficult for people who follow God. Even before it gets totally unrestrained, we can very likely go through some serious difficulties. While lawlessness, lawlessness is still at work. <coughs> but one day it's going to be unrestrained. Again, all this is going to happen until God decides, Holy Spirit, restrainer, you're out of the way now. Let lawlessness go crazy. And I, I like this verse. It's in one verse. I call it one breath or one sentence. And then the lawlessness, the lawless one <coughs> will be revealed in the same breath, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. It's going to be so big, but for the Lord, destruction of the lawlessness, when we do that again, pff, gone. <laughs> That's how simple it's going to be for God to be done with this sin on the earth. And I should tell my wife to stop laughing. Control, self-control, at least. She doesn't like my poof. Uh, she's going to be talking to me all, all this week about that one. Um, but, that, but that's what the Lord's going to do. It's going to be so simple. It's going to be, it's going to be done with. Can, can you wait for that day? All evil. All lawlessness. All this junky stuff that we have to experience. It's going to be gone. And this is part of the steps Come on, come back with me now. Come on. Focus, focus. Don't get distracted. It's all going to be gone. Just like since here today, in the future, it's going to be, we're going to be done with it. It's going to be no longer part of our daily experience. I can't wait for that day. Danny was just saying to me, man, this would be a good time for us to be all done, Lord. Wouldn't it? And we be gathered together with him. That day's coming. But there's going to be this lawless one. Lawless, lawless one is going to come. He's going to be powerful. He's going to have the uh, ability to do miracles or things that look like miracles. Supernatural powers. He's going to trick people. It says he's, he's going to work. Uh, let's see what verses if I can read it again. The, the coming of the lawless, lawless one is by the activity of Satan. That's why I would say he's going to be possessed by Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deceptions. That's going to be the thing that's going to grow. Wicked deception. Maybe he's going to be the best magician in all the earth or maybe it's going to be supernatural power at work that Satan has. And people are going to be um, deceived, so fully deceived, we're not going to be able to believe how deceived people can get. And the, the reason for that is they, just like this lawless, lawless one, this man, that at some point in their life they said no to God. You say no to God, then you enter, entertain ideas from spirits 
or people or things that you've read, whatever, and you let that grow and you let that grow and then it's too late. And God steps in, and this time especially, God steps in and God does even an extra deception, a delusion he sends people because they've already said no to God. I see who you are. I see the greatness around me. And I say to you, no, thank you. Don't want anything to do with you. And you will get so massively deceived. It'll look like mental illness. Well, who knows what it's going to look like? Just the amount of evil. <coughs> we ask, can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Um, okay, so this is saying that the coming of the Lord and us being gathered together with him won't happen until this stuff happens. So this lawless, this lawless one is going to be on the earth, and we as Christians, no matter when the rapture happens, we as Christians could very likely see this one. Because we don't know the timing of it exactly. There's going to be a rebellion. There's going to be uh, unrestricted evil. And then this lawless is going to come, and then we're going to be gathered together with him. That's the order of it. Now, how long the evil is on the earth before we're gathered together, we don't know the timeline of that. We might see him. We might, we might be able to recognize him before we're gathered together with the Lord. And, and he's going to look good in the beginning. He's going to look good. It's going to look like he has the answers to the world, I think. That's what it looks like to me in the Bible. Because people are going to be drawn to him. They're going to like him because they're going to be deceived by him, believing he has the answers to our life. <coughs> but we don't know the timetable exactly of when this happens. But that won't come until some of this happens already. The rebellion and the lawlessness one revealed, then the Lord comes and gathers us to himself. Now, what happens when it happens and what happens on earth after that? We don't know, know all of those details yet. And so, why does this happen? And let's, let's go ahead and finish with verse 11 and 12 here. And so, so, and with all, I'll start at 10 again. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they, because they refuse to love the truth and to be saved. They would not admit to absolute truth. They would not admit to the truth that God's communicated. Therefore, verse 11, since that's true, therefore, God sends them a strong delusion. All right, they're already deceived by the lawlessness, the Antichrist, the one that's man's possessed by Satan. They're already deceived by him, following him, and they don't believe God. Then... God on top of that, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. So in their own ability, they're already believing what is false. And God does an extra whammy because they've rejected him. And they're going to get so far away from him. So they might believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's how the world's going to be. And God's going to say, you've rejected me and you've decided to believe a lie. Okay, here you go. Here's more. More delusion. And your condemnation is going to be great because you would not believe me. You would not confess me as your creator. And, and you know what? I loved you. I provided for you. And you told me, no, go away. And they're going to be condemned. And they're going to be further deceived by God. How awful is that? <coughs> First, you got Satan deceiving people, and they decide to follow him. Then God's going to give you a, a stronger delusion so that you even more believe what is false. Um, and the reasons for this, uh, I wish I had more time to read this, but Romans chapter 1, on purpose, people suppress the truth. They put it down. They have it. Uh, no, 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 I don't like that. Have it some more? No, 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 I don't like that. I'm going to push it down. I'm going to do my own thing. I like what I'm doing and what I decide to do. Push that off to the side. What God says is right and good. Oh, no, 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 I don't really want That doesn't make me feel good. That doesn't make me feel good about myself. I feel like I need to do this. And they suppress it. 
by their evil activity on purpose. <coughs> Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Not only do they do them, they give approval to those who practice them. So not only do they do it themselves, but they feel, oh, good job, and you're evil. It gets built up more and more people. It gets deceived, further deceived, worse, farther, greater and greater evil, because they chose to not believe him. After they received so many great things from him. So Paul talks about the coming of the Lord, our being gathered together. Hey, hold on a second. It can't happen until this kind of thing happens. It's not just persecution where you live. It's not just difficulty where you live. This is a big thing. This is a worldwide thing, part of the big picture plan of God. Be encouraged. Not yet. You haven't missed the Lord. Oh, by the way, he is still coming because 2,000 years is not that big a deal. He is coming back. Just like he came the first time, taught the truth, explained about their existence and their life and how to know God and and how God loved them. And you you love God too. Jesus explained all that and he came and he did that and he went to be with his father and he spoke the truth during that whole time. And when he told, told us he's coming back, he was speaking the truth too. He's coming back again. That's gonna happen one day. And we're either gonna die physically and be with him forever or he's gonna come take us before we die and we're gonna be with him forever. Isn't that awesome? That encourages me. That helps me through my day. When I remember it, I need to continue to remember and be reminded. So so he talks about all that yucky stuff that's going to happen first. And I'm going to just finish reading um, this verse 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, um, beloved by the Lord, because God shows you as his first fruits to be saved. And, to, and through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Now, you guys are doing good, but remember these things. Keep going and keep being faithful. And just today, I had to do this form for my job because I work in ministry and I had to write this church. And there was a praise. What's, what's one of your praise items they were asking me? I had to write this down. This is one thing I said. I am so thankful that God has given us a local church where people love him, They love his word. They stay firm to his word, regardless of the pressure of the outside world. That was my praise. And that's you guys. I I honestly say that. I love this. I love the people here. I love our firmness around what God's communicated. And that's not hard. It's not easy to find these days. It's really easy to find church light, church apostate, and church ridiculous. It's easy to find those. It really is easy. I've been to some of them. And, 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 but I found this place. I love it. I, I love the friendships and, fel- and fellowship that I found here and that, that, that solid conviction to we're going to follow God. We're, gonna, we're not going to let people deceive us. We're not going to let things creep in. We need to keep on with that. Let's not let anyone deceive us in any way, any source, any form. We press on and we courage. We remind each other. That's awesome. I love it. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time in your word. Thank you for this instruction. Thank you for letting us know uh, various times about what's going to happen at the end days of this earth. Thank you that we can rest and we can be looking around and discerning the times and, and know that you haven't come yet. You haven't gathered uh, your, your people to yourself and that we somehow missed it. We have things we're looking for and we're waiting for you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your word that encourages us. And thank you for the friendships that we find here. In Jesus' name, amen.